Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. I've never been afraid that I was a dummy. Foolish, yes. Having blind spots, of course. Able to err, most assuredly. But it's a rare situation indeed where I am unwilling to at least enter into a question to see if I can be of any help to finding the answer. Which is why I found this whole COVID-19 thing to be so profoundly weird to me. I'm given to having opinions on things, and I try to restrain myself from having opinions on things I don't know about, like when the you know latest scandal or gossip gets tossed around the internet, I try to stay out of it because I know I don't know. But on issues, I tend to think I can figure it out. But this time, from beginning to end, I could, not because, I'm not saying this means it's terrible, I don't know whether it's terrible. I don't know. In fact, the real issue for me has been my absolute inability to grasp with any confidence whatsoever any of the statistics. We're watching experts on every side vociferously disagreeing with each other. Just the other day, my precious wife posted uh, an article or a a YouTube video. I'm not sure what it was. It was a a piece of some kind talking about the virtues and values of of wearing masks during these times. And someone came in and responded, which is perfectly fine, again, because we all have our (laughs) opinions on this. Somebody came in and said, well, hey, have you seen this article from the New England Journal of Medicine? basically taking the opposite view from what you posted, Lisa. And Lisa responded back and said, why, yes, I have. Have you seen this article, also by the New England Journal of Medicine, that repudiated the article from the New England Journal of Medicine that you cited? The New England Journal of Medicine can't go from one issue to the next without changing their mind. How in the world do we think we can understand this? I had an appointment this morning, and on my way back, I had on sports radio. I confess that when I'm not listening to music, I'm usually listening to sports radio. And they were talking about the upcoming college football season, if there's going to be one. Because as I'm recording, yesterday, the Big Ten champ, or Big Ten uh, Conference uh, announced their decision that all of their fall sports Uh, would only have in-conference games. And it's expected that other major conferences may follow suit. And again, there's the back and forth of, we don't even know if people are going to come back to college, how long they're going to come back to college. We don't know whether we're, you know, the spikes that we're seeing right now are uh, the fulfillment of the scary warnings that the Chicken Littles gave us when they said, oh, the second wave is going to be so terrible, or whether the fact that so few people are dying is proof that the people who were yelling at the Chicken Littles saying you're worrying over nothing were right. I don't know. I have no idea. And I don't know which way the country's going to swing. You know, if you backed me against a corner and said to me, R.C., what do you think about uh, the spring of 2020? 
and how things were handled. I, I, I'm going to take the view. This is way, way overblown, profoundly destructive. It's not a good thing for everybody to be sitting at home for all these months. Uh, but even that, even if giving that answer, I would do so saying, of course, I don't know what would have happened if we didn't. That's the problem. We don't have a controlled experiment where we try over here this way and we try over there that way. You can look at the uh, herd immunity strategies in Sweden and there too, people cook their numbers to have them say what they want. Again, I don't know. I don't know if we are staring down the barrel of something worse than what we've just been through. Or I don't know if that perspective is simply a higher grade chicken little fever. I don't know. I do know that I don't need to know. I do know that there are things that I need to know, and that's not one of them. You know, when Jesus says, hoping you'll remember uh, the piece I did, black and white and red all over, in which we affirm that all of the Bible is red letters. When Jesus says in the book of James, do not say tomorrow I'm going to go into this town and do this kind of business and make this kind of profit and then come back. For you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Say instead, if the Lord wills. You're not avoiding that injunction, that command, if you're avoiding the subject of business or travel. You're falling into the same condemnation if you take the position that this is what we know is going to happen tomorrow. Let me tell you something. I've been a student of economics for more than 40 years. I published my first book 35 years ago on economics. And at that time and from that time, all I have seen the government do has been destructive to the well-being of the economy. I remember before the national debt was over a trillion dollars. Now it's over a trillion dollars every year. And I heard calamity, 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 calamity. I'm not arguing that deficit spending is a good thing. I'm not arguing that it's not destructive. I'm not arguing that it's not unjust. It's all of those things. I am saying you can't predict calamity for 40 years, have it not come, and not grow a little skeptical. Sure, one time the wolf was really coming. But that's what happens. You know, one of the things that I'm doing right now, I'm a college professor, and I'm waiting to hear what's going to happen at Little Ivy Tech Community College in the fall. The rumors are it's going to be a buffet that you can go to online classes that meet over Zoom. You can have online classes that don't meet at all. You can have uh, some sort of hybrid where you come part of the time or, or and don't come part of the time. You can come all the time and there's some fifth option. I can't imagine what it is, but supposedly there's some fifth option as well. I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know this. I do know that the wanton spread of untruth makes it virtually impossible for truth to stand firm. This summer I've been teaching a class on ethics. I taught the same class uh, last spring as well. And uh, one of the things that we talk about at the very beginning of class is, is it ever okay to lie? Now, believe it or not, as a Christian, I believe there are circumstances where it's okay to lie. Uh, I do think, however, those circumstances are much, 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 much more rare than what most people say. Almost every student that I've ever had right on this theme always comes back and defends little white lies. And every time I've come back and said, now look, I have no quarrel with the perspective that says 
if my hostess asks me if I like the uh, pork loaf and I don't, and I say that I do, that it will it'll spare us some embarrassment and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I believe that. I don't believe I should do that, but I do believe it'll spare embarrassment. But here's what else that does long term. If no one ever answers that question, hey, did you like this honestly, then whenever you like something, no one will be able to believe you. You can't constantly tell lies and then expect the truth to be believed. And it doesn't even have to be lies. When you run around insisting, it's this or it's that. It's this, it's this, it's this, it's this. And you don't even know whether it's that for sure. And then it's not that. That when you say it's this and it is this, no one's going to believe you. I want you to compare. I want, I want you to, to, to sort of scroll through your own mind, your own experience, reading the headlines or, or watching the news or however it is you consume news. I want you to compare two things. One, the scope and the spread and the size and the loudness of the end of the world apocalypse headlines that came to us in March and April compare how widespread that stuff went in March and April to those articles that have come out in the last month or so calmly peacefully quietly in a corner saying these predictions were astronomically off not a little bit off not a lot off astronomically off now again i'm not saying that social distancing and masks and staying at home didn't cause it to change i don't know how would i i don't know that there might not have been millions of dead if we didn't do all that i just don't know I do know this. If not the scientists themselves, at least the journalists uh, presented, and the politicians presented this to us, not as if we don't do X, Y could happen, but Y is going to happen. Get ready. Dig in. Hunker down. Get your toilet paper because the end of the world's coming. I want us as Christians not only to be Berean about those who claim to teach us from the Word of God, but to be Berean about every truth claim that comes our way. I'm not talking about a posture of snide cynicism. I'm talking about a cautiousness a humility about our own capacity to know and our own swiftness to plant our flag before we really do know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the government's going to do. I don't know what's going to happen with sports. As I've said before, I am just Really, really hoping we get a football season, professional football season. College football is not so important in my estimation. I know others like it a lot. But I don't want a lot of people getting sick. I, I will say this. One thing I'm pretty confident about, one thing the numbers are really, really showing, is that the percentage of people who die once they get COVID-19 is really, really small. What that means about what we should do, that I don't know. For now, I'm going to continue to wear my mask when I'm asked to. I'm going to continue to not have great crowds in my home. 
I'm going to continue to teach my classes online. And I'm going to continue to produce the Jesus Changes Everything podcast. Not because I'm afraid. Not because I don't know. I'm sorry. I wish I could be the podcast that knows. But I'm not. I'm the podcast that knows Jesus Changes Everything. Some of you may be wondering where we're going now. Having worked our way through various and sundry meetings with Jesus, having gotten to Jesus' ascension, you may have been surprised that I had more. And so we looked at Paul on the road to Damascus. Excuse me, on the road. Yes, on the road to Damascus. And that you might have thought surely must be the end. But today I want us to consider another meeting with Jesus, this one with John. John, the beloved disciple who has been exiled to the island of Patmos. And there he is worshiping the living God and he tells us that he is in the spirit and he is given this vision, this revelation. And he's given very early on, or he gives to us rather, a description of the Jesus that he beholds. And this description is not like what we'd expect. It's not what we're used to. Because the Jesus that he describes is exalted, is lifted up. His hair is described as white. The whole point of the message for John, the whole point of the message for John's original audience, and the whole point of the message for us in this very, very difficult book of Revelation. The whole point is for us to learn and to remember and to rest in and to rejoice knowing that Jesus reigns. That reign that exaltation. I want us to be careful as we come close, though not all the way there, close to the end of this series, as we have taken a look at Jesus drawing near. And as we now come to this description of Jesus in this high and lofty, exalted position, I don't want us to, as we remember that he's near, forget that he is transcendent. And as we remember that he is transcendent, we must never forget that he is near. John is astonished. He is surprised, but he begins to listen and gives us this description of all that he sees in this vision. He records for us the words that come out of the lips of Jesus. He records for us his own uncertainty, his own confusion, his own fears. But he's with Jesus. He's with the exalted Jesus. You see, here is where heaven and earth meet. In the incarnation, we have an invasion of, in a sense, a foreign land by the living God. When he takes on flesh and he dwells among us, he stoops down to us. And there we meet. But we don't, in that closeness, lose his transcendence because he comes as God in the flesh. But his transcendence does come here. In the book of Revelation, however, after Jesus has been lifted up and exalted and ascended to his throne, the opposite happens. It's not that Jesus comes back down to John, but rather that Jesus lifts John up to him. He's lifted up into the true and eternal Mount Zion, where he meets 
with the souls of just men made perfect, and with Christ whose blood speaks of better things than Abel. I hope those words ring a bell for you because that description comes out of Hebrews and it is in my judgment a description about what happens to all of us when we meet with the living God in worship. Now the transcendent God lifts us up to him so that we can be near. Now, instead of him entering into our misery, he lifts us up into his glory. And John is given a vision of what awaits us, given a vision of what will come. You know, there's been a lot of uh, drama in the church wrestling over people writing books describing their after-death experiences who have come back. And one of the things that I always respond with is what Jesus had to say in the parable of Lazarus and Dives, where the rich man says, can I send someone back to warn my brothers that this is all too real? Can I go back? And the answer is, you can send any ghost you want. They already have the word of God. If they, A ghost isn't going to change anything. And that's sort of my answer to those who think there's just so much apologetical hay or evangelistic hay that can be made out of these people's visits to heaven. Now, I don't pretend to know whether they're real or not, but I do know this. Something that we have that wasn't even present when Jesus gave that illustration is the story of a man who went up into heaven and came back and told us what he saw, all inspired by the Holy Spirit. John, in his revelation, tells us of the glory of Christ and our closeness to him, and in so doing assures us of where we're going. And next time, when we continue and actually conclude our series on meeting Jesus, we'll look forward to our meeting with him there. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast, a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsportjr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything.